class. We enjoyed ours. We had the Sunday school report. Adults had nine and sixty-one dollars. Beginners six and eleven dollars. Kelly attendance got changed. Our dollars and seventy-two dollars. All right, we're done. You ready?
Idiot. Father, Lord, we bow before you this morning, and Father, we are uh, once again so thankful that you've allowed us the opportunity and the privilege of coming here this morning to uh, to worship you and to uh, look into your word. And Father, we thank you for the lesson we've already had here this morning. Father, help us continue to have our hearts and our minds open to your word. Father, I do ask that you bless this offering to help us to be able to acknowledge how we can best use it to further your work, to further your kingdom. Lord, do continue to bless all the prayer requests that lay upon our hearts this morning. Father, you know each one of them what their needs to be are. Father, I do ask to continue blessings upon this church. Lord, help us to ever be a light and uh, witness to you here in our community. Help us be mindful of things that we are we need to be doing and help us have the grace and strength we need to accomplish them. Lord, do bless this nation and guide our leaders. Lord, do forgive us of our sins. Which in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 140. 140, first to last.
you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we are going to be in the book of Acts chapter 8. Uh, so Acts chapter 8, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. So Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. Uh, as we begin looking into this 8th chapter uh, of the book of Acts, we continue to see a theme uh, that we were introduced to in the prior chapter. Uh, really the, the middle point of chapter 6 uh, is really where this uh, theme began. But this is one of those important um, sections in the book of Acts where we are uh, confronted uh, with the reality and with the importance of understanding uh, that it was not uh, only uh, the apostles who were actively engaged in working uh, for well, uh, the apostles played a, a pivotal role, that's very true. They were the leaders, they were the, uh, the ordained uh, individuals who had the gifts, who were uh, working in Jerusalem at the time, uh, but they weren't the only ones. Uh, there was a large number of people in the church of Jerusalem, uh, and they were all, uh, at least large portions of them, were actively engaged in the work of the Lord. Uh, it is important that we never forget how important and how necessary it is to the health and to the uh, the work of New Testament churches to have the entire church working and engaged in the work that the Lord is doing. Uh, but it says in verse 1, it says that Saul was consenting unto his death. That's Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, uh, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judah and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hauling men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And, gave, and the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, saying, uh, gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried in a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and that were lame were healed. There was great joy in that city. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time the same city used sorcerers, and which the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regarded they had regard because of that, that long time he had bewitched them to sorcery. For they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. We're going to stop our reading uh, right there. As we uh, look at the New Testament church here in Acts chapter 8. There are a few things uh, about the church here that we need to, to understand. Uh, first of all, uh, this was a church persecuted. Uh, this was a church persecuted. As you look at verse 1, we're introduced to a character by the name of Saul. Now we're dealing more with Saul uh, a little bit uh, later. As you get into the next chapter and you see his conversion, we'll deal with Saul specifically uh, then. But what we find is, is that Saul, it says, was consenting to Stephen's death. Now, uh, if you back up to 7, we saw where Stephen uh, was martyred. Uh, he had, uh, as a, a deacon in the church, he was preaching and teaching, and they took him out, and they eventually stoned him and killed him uh, because of his faith in Christ, because of his stance for uh, the gospel. Uh, and so that was uh, the introduction, really, to this great wave of persecution. You know, uh, the New Testament church, in the book of Acts, up to this point in time, they, they've had their share of adversities, uh, and persecution to a, uh, to a degree. Uh, 
Uh, but nothing like what is about to be introduced here in this eighth chapter. Uh, the apostles were persecuted. They were arrested. Uh, they've been told not to, to preach and not to declare the gospel. They have been told uh, that they shouldn't do those things. They should no longer preach in the name of Christ. Uh, but now this preaching has claimed the life uh, of a great leader in the church. Persecution comes in varying forms. It comes in different uh, intensities as you look throughout the word of God and really throughout history as a whole. Uh, Sometimes persecution is nothing more than uh, simply uh, the government saying no, may not do anything. But there also come times where persecution is intense and it causes great havoc in the Lord's work, which is what we find here in this eighth chapter. Uh, as uh, Saul continued to his death and there came a great persecution after the church. Uh, the world essentially had had enough. If you want to think of it in, in that term. Uh, the New Testament church had been working and working and they were having great success. But now the world and uh, now the Pharisees and Jews here, uh, they have had enough. Uh, they, we've told them uh, not to preach. Uh, we've told them not to interfere uh, with what we are have going for us here in Jerusalem. But they have not listened. They have not done as we told them to, and so now they unleash this great persecution as it's called here in verse 1. And this church that is, is persecuted and it actually results in many of them having to scatter abroad. Uh, the persecution becomes so intense uh, that they can't stay. Uh, you know, at this point in time, there are several thousand people in Jerusalem that are followers of Christ, and they, they simply can't stay. And so now they are, are forced to, to scatter, uh, to flee, essentially. They end up going all throughout the very regions of Judah and Samaria. Uh, and it, Saul, Saul just continues to make havoc. As the church is persecuted, they're scattered throughout the very regions. Uh, that's uh, a great hardship. You know, when you think about the, the church losing membership along the way, the church of Jerusalem just lost a lot of members. Uh, at this time, as they were forced to flee to Jerusalem, and they go everywhere. <laughs> they they go through all the surrounding areas. You know, our terminology about thinking that they went throughout the other counties and cities that were there uh, about them. Uh, and not only did they uh, scatter, uh, but those who were left also got persecuted even more. Uh, Saul says in verse three began entering into houses and taking men and women and committing them uh, into prison. Uh, and we find out later that Saul was doing nothing but breathing threatenings and uh, and slaughter against the disciples of Christ. Uh, Saul wanted nothing to do with this gospel, wanted nothing to do with these individuals, and he was doing anything in his power to subvert them, uh, to cause them to silence, to stop preaching his message. No longer is he going into the temple and bringing them out which is what they were doing with the apostles. You, know, you back up in the book of Acts, you know, Peter and John were preaching in the temple uh, or in the courtyards, and the Jews go get them and arrest them, go in prison. Now they are militant. Now they are uh, seeking out those who claim to be a prize, going into their homes and arresting them. Uh, they're throwing them in prison. Uh, those that were scattered went out. Uh, those who stayed got even more intense persecution. They were uh, thrown into prison and uh, persecuted heavily because of their faith in Christ. Uh, persecution is going to have different effects. It's going to affect different people in different ways. Uh, some are going to have to leave. And some are going to choose to stay. Uh, to stay in their, their cities, their communities, and continue to do the work uh, that is placed before them. Uh, persecution comes in, in different forms. It comes in different uh, ways. Uh, it always comes from the world in uh, some fashion or another, whether that's the religious authorities or the governing authorities, but the world is going to seek to persecute and to eliminate uh, this message because the message interferes with their lifestyle. It interferes with what they are wanting uh, to accomplish. But what is uh, important to note here, and what I think is very interesting to note, is that throughout all of this persecution, uh, the apostles, uh, first of all, weren't scattered. Uh, for those that are scattered abroad, the apostles weren't. Uh, they stayed put. 
it says in verse 1, it says, except for the apostles. Now, we'll find out here a little bit later that they that some of the apostles did travel here and there uh, in itinerantly preaching, uh, but as for a base, the apostles chose to stay. Uh, they didn't flee Jerusalem as the rest of the church did, as many of the church did. And yet, in verse 4, again, uh, in verse 3 and verse 4, again, it's not necessarily the apostles. Uh, it is the entirety of the church. The apostles are the leaders. But now it's not just the leadership. It is the church as a whole. Uh, it's the, uh, the everyday believers that are uh, suffering here. They may not have been teachers in the church. They may not have even been uh, leaders. Uh, but they were faithful. And because of that, uh, they are now being thrown into prison and suffering because of their faith in Christ. When it comes to persecution, uh, it is important to understand that it will not just be the leaders, and it will not simply be uh, those that may be in quote-unquote power uh, in the church, uh, but it's anyone. Uh, anyone who claims to be uh, the follower of Christ stands in jeopardy of persecution. Uh, that's the way it was in Acts, the way it still is today. The world is not simply going to go after those who uh, seem to be pillars or leaders in the church. They may do that. They've done that before. But ultimately, it is anyone and everyone who is affiliated with Christ. As Paul would tell Timothy, those that wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. As a child of God today, it is important that you do not forget that serving Christ and living for Him at times comes with great cost. And it may cost you very little in this earthly life, or it might cost you severely. It might cost you everything. It might cost you your life before it's all said and done. But, what's, but the fact of the matter is that for all that it might cost you here, it has great reward in the end. Uh, there is nothing that this world has to offer. Uh, there is no riches. Uh, there is no value that this world has that can even begin to compare uh, to the riches that are awaiting you and I as a child of God. That can compare to the coming kingdom. Why strive and bend and compromise the kingdoms that have their set in when we serve in a kingdom that has no end? Uh, you can look to the things this world has to offer you. Uh, you can look and say, well, if I can uh, stop believing in Christ, if I stop going to church, if I stop uh, believing in these things, living for Christ, then I'll have an easier life here. Uh, I'll have better friends. I'll have more friends here if I don't serve Christ. I'll have more wealth here. I'll have more things in this life if I simply stop serving Christ. That's what this church could have. Uh, all of those in Jerusalem could have done that. Uh, they could have stopped preaching the gospel. They could have stopped uh, living for the Lord. And they could have gone back to the synagogues, gone back to the old way of life, gone back to their old friends, whatever old, the old lifestyles they may have had. They didn't do that. Uh, they saw the heavenly reward, and that is what they chose to cling to. That is what they looked to. It matters more to them what Christ thought. And Christ's reward mattered more to them than the earthly pleasures and privileges. In times of persecution, it becomes very clear what it is that we as God's children are seeking after. Uh, when it comes to understanding the need to, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that will be made very clear in first times of persecution. Uh, when persecution comes, it has the ability to reveal and to make known to the entirety of the world what it is that we are truly seeking after. What you and I as God's children truly are desiring and wanting to do. And wanting to make known. Uh, the reality of our faith is often seen and manifested in the persecutions 
that we endure. That is why that there will be many in times of persecution who may walk away and have nothing more to do with it because they don't want to endure the hardship. There will be those who stay, who choose to follow Christ. There will be those that many may look at and say, you know what? Whatever it is they believe in and follow, it matters to them because they're willing to even put their lives on the line for that gospel. And so they will investigate it. And some might even choose to believe in it. Persecution has great results to the church because persecution reveals to the world that you know what? It's not fun and games. Uh, it's not some passing fancy that we cleave to, but it is a true God and a true salvation. It is something that truly exists and matters. It is the point that we are willing to die if need be for the cause of Christ. As uh, the church persecuted, and it wasn't simply the apostles, but it was all of them. As some were forced to, to leave, some chose to stay. But all were willing to suffer for the cause of the gospel. Now, as you understand the church persecuted, uh, it is important also to now notice uh, the church uh, proclaiming. The responsibility of the New Testament church was what? To go out and to make disciples. Go you therefore in, into the world and preach the gospel. Uh, and that's what Christ told the uh, disciples of the church in the New Great Commission. It's what he emphasized there in the first chapter of Acts before he sent it up. Was what? Uh, go out and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. And here, the church is preaching. Uh, and they are proclaiming the truth of the gospel. For it said in verse 1, they were scattered abroad to all of these different regions. But what did they do in verse 4? It says, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, what? Preaching the word. Of course, we see one specific example of that uh, in Philip, uh, who we find went down to Samaria, it says in verse 5, and preached Christ unto them. Those that stayed in Jerusalem, they had the apostles who were there preaching and teaching the word of God who were making known all there uh, that the gospel of Christ, that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and they rose again the third day. And all of those who left Jerusalem, when they left, they didn't leave out of fear and intimidation. They left because they were sick. And they knew that God's will for them to go. And so they left. And as they left, they went out preaching. They went out as the sower went to see, they went out wherever they had to go and to find safety. But as they left, they went preaching. Uh, they left Jerusalem, they went to the different cities they may have come to along the way. And as they went, they preached. And as they went, they made known to everyone the word of God. Paul had great missionary journeys, and many men came to know Christ through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. Uh, many men came to know Christ, the preachings of Peter on the day of Pentecost and throughout his own missionary journeys and adventures that we come to in the book of Acts. We'll see later in Cornelius and other things. But yet also many, many came to know Christ through the works of everyday individuals in the New Testament church who simply went out and they preached the word of God. They weren't apostles, they weren't deacons, they weren't ordained men in any what you say, form or fashion. But they were simply men and women who loved the Lord and who did what they had to do as they went abroad. They said, they know. They preached. They taught the word of God. Whether that was in synagogues, perhaps they had the opportunity to do that, or perhaps it was simply in street corners. Perhaps it was simply in the marketplace trying to buy and sell food or their goods that they had to have. They, at every opportunity, preached the word of God. And they made known to individuals the truth of the gospel and their great need to repent and to believe and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The church may have been persecuted. They may have been scattered, but they were still busily engaged in the work that was to be done. They did not take persecution as an excuse or as an opportunity to stop doing the work. They knew what they were supposed to do, and they weren't going to stop doing it. And it might have been an inconvenience for them. It might have been a hardship 
for them. But they kept on preaching the word of God. Which is exactly what you and I are supposed to be doing today. Uh, your responsibility as a child of God today, your responsibility as a, a member of this church, your responsibility is to be sharing and making known the word of God. Uh, preaching uh, not only what we do or what you're listening to now, but you have a responsibility to be heralded, to be declaring the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news uh, that Christ has died for sinners, uh, any sinner who makes a choice and the decision to repent, to believe the Lord Jesus Christ may receive salvation. That is your responsibility. That is your job to pay as a child of God. You may not hold an office in the church, you may not have any uh, responsibilities in the church, period. Uh, but yet, as a child of God, you do have a responsibility. You have a need and a responsibility to be declaring and making known what God has done for you and what he can do for others. Uh, the problem that we run into so many times is that we as God's children uh, become intimidated become uncertain, and we simply do not make known. These individuals here are being persecuted in the face of very certain death, but yet they just kept on preaching and teaching the Word of God. Despite adverse circumstances, despite uh, the dangers to their lives, they kept on doing the Word of the Lord. How often do you and I as God's children allow the things of this world, the things of this life to keep us from doing the work of the Lord? Uh, so many times it seems like it doesn't even take persecution to stop a child of God from doing what they're supposed to do. Oftentimes anymore it seems like it's just uh, the everyday courses of life. Can't do the work of the Lord. Got too many other responsibilities. Got too many other things that need to be done that we need to be engaged in. Well, that's work or uh or hobbies, or things of that nature. We allow all of these things to keep us from serving the Lord. How sad it is that God's children at times are so easily swayed and so easily kept from doing what God has called them and what God has told them that they are supposed to be done. The early church wasn't deterred or deterred from doing the Lord's work, even by intense persecution. Yet they kept on driving. They look to the focus that they are supposed to have. They look to the fact that the kingdom of God was soon got. They look to the Calvary. They saw what God did for them and their, his death upon the cross of Calvary. They looked to the great salvation they had by grace alone. Uh, they looked to the coming in fact of knowing that Christ was one day coming again. And they said all of these things matter more than the adversities and the hardships that we might be suffering and enduring here now, yes, the church was persecuted, but the church was also preaching and heralding and proclaiming the word of God. They are making known to anyone, everyone who would listen, the need to accept Christ. As you look throughout these verses, you find that they had great success. Uh, the word of God was proclaimed. As it was proclaimed, the men listened and men made uh, decisions to accept Christ and to follow him. You and I today oftentimes have great, uh, have little success in the Lord's work because we have little commitment to the Lord's work. And men don't truly understand nor see in us the reality of what we believe. If we are not willing to live for Christ, why should others be willing to accept Christ? If Christ doesn't mean enough to us to truly impact and change the life that we have, then why do we think that others are going to want to listen to what we have to say and listen to the truth of the gospel? Men need to see Christ in our actions, and men need to see Christ in the words that we proclaim. The gospel has impact. The gospel has power. But we as God's children need to be living the gospel, and we need to be proclaiming the gospel. Too often times we have short-sighted uh, ourselves, and we have failed to make known to truly believe in the gospel, to live it as it needs to be lived. Yes, the church was persecuted, the church 
was proclaiming. And as you find uh, now uh, with Philip, uh, the church was also uh, victorious. Uh, they were uh, great work that was done. Uh, as Philip, we were told, went to Samaria, which we were told that many went throughout the regions of Samaria preaching and proclaiming, and so uh, I don't know who else, and the Bible doesn't specifically tell us of other individuals that may have gone uh, with uh, Philip, or how many there may have been, but here's Philip. Uh, this was an individual, if you back up uh, into chapter 6, you find that Philip was one of the ones that was ordained uh, as a deacon there in the church of Jerusalem. Uh, he was one of the original ones, uh, him and Stephen uh, both. And so Stephen was martyred in the prior chapter. Uh, he was ordained as a deacon, and he was martyred for his stance of the faith. And now we find Philip, uh, who much like Stephen, uh, was a, a preacher. He was a proclaimer. He was one who was making known the word of God. Uh, Stephen, as far as we know, never got the chance to go beyond Jerusalem of the proclamation of the gospel. But yet Philip, the first instance we find of him, uh, proclaiming and making known the word of God uh, is he not in Jerusalem but in Samaria. Uh, the first great witness to the Samaritans uh, came by the hand of Christ himself. <coughs> so Jesus went to Samaria and he uh, sat by the well and he talked to the woman who uh, was there and then she went back to Samaria and made known that she found the crop, uh, one who told her all things she did up, and he was the Messiah. And now this next great campaign we find in Samaria wasn't done by an apostle. wasn't done by Peter or, or John or any individuals who were uh, there on that day when Christ spoke to that Samaritan woman. But instead it was by uh, this man, Philip, who has very little backstory. We have very little knowledge of really anything that he, he did before uh, being ordained there in chapter 2. We don't know. But yet here he is. A man who would love the Lord, who is willing to now go to Samaria and to proclaim and to make known Christ. Samaritans were Gentiles, but they were just about as shunned and as unwelcome in the Jewish life as the Gentiles were. The Samaritans, who most Jews did everything in their power to avoid and to circumvent. Uh, they, they would go extra miles just to avoid going through Samaria. We had here's God's servants standing in Samaria. Uh, Philip going to those the Jews would have nothing to do with. And he makes known to them the word of God. And as you find here that there was great power in the things that Philip did. Uh, Philip went with power and authority. Uh, as Philip spoke, a man listened. We're told in verse 6 that the people with one accord gave heed to those things that Philip did. Uh, Philip preached and men chose to believe. In verse 12 we find that they believed Philip preaching their things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. What great power did he have? Uh, Philip came, he's preaching to these Samaritans about the kingdom of God, about the authority that Christ had, and as they listened to him speak, they heeded it. They gave heed to it. That is, they accepted the things that Peter, that Philip said. And as Philip and as they did that, they chose to believe and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they knew that salvation was in no other than in Jesus Christ. Well, that's what Philip told them. And they were willing to accept and to believe in those things. You see, if the church is truly proclaiming and doing the work that it is supposed to be doing, uh, they will find success. They will find victory. Uh, in the work that is done. It may not always be in as vast numbers as you find oftentimes in the book of Acts, but yet it is there. Uh, when the word of God is preached, lives are impacted, and the souls are and can be proclaimed and saved through the work of Christ. Philip had nothing more than a deacon, but yet he was willing to go uh, to Samaria and to preach the word of God. And by his hand, God did various things uh, miracles. He allowed certain miracles to be done. Uh, the healing of the lame, the casting out of demons. And now every man looked at Philip as they looked at the apostles. I uh, one who proclaimed a message that was verified by the works of the Lord. And they listened to it. And they yielded to it. 
Uh, they accepted the things that he had done. Uh, he would be introduced to a man by the name of Simon, who was once the, the great uh, uh, sorcerer, the great uh, magician, if you want to call it that, the great healer there in Samaria. Uh, but yet, even he, it says, at least in our verses that we read this morning, uh, that he believed uh, Philip, and he believed and trusted in the things that he had said and done. For all of the, uh, the the paganism, for all of the influence of non uh, godly sources that we find in Samaria, but yet all of them were overcome by the power of the gospel. Uh, this man had long bewitched them, had long held Samaria in bondage by his tricks, by his uh, efforts that he had done. But we're not specifically told what all kinds of you know, things that he did, specifically speaking, but whatever uh, acts that he did, he wished it. He had gotten the people to follow after him and to think that he was a great uh, uh, man of great power and special ability, some kind of uh, divine appointee. But yet, for all that he claimed to do, there was nothing compared to what God could actually do. You see, that's the thing about the power of the gospel is it has greater power than anything this world can even hope to muster. Uh, whatever shows, whatever tricks that Simon thought he could do and that they thought he did, they're nothing compared to what Philip was actually able to do. Uh, the healing of the lame, uh, the allowing these men to walk again. The, the healings, the miracles that Philip did, it verified to everyone there, this is the word of God. <laughs> Uh, this man truly knows what God wants us to do, and they listened to it, and they accepted it. Uh, the message of Christ was proclaimed, and men yielded, and men accepted it. You and I today need to never forget that our responsibility is to proclaim the Word of God. Our job today as New Testament churches is to proclaim, uh, to, to spread abroad uh, the message of Jesus Christ. The results are not up to you, and it ain't up to me. Our job is to work. Our job is to make known the Word of God. Uh, the results are outside of our ability. When, once we plant the seed of the gospel of Christ, you may find that there will be times that many will accept it the first time they hear it. That no, it's happened that way. Many times it's happened that way. But that's not our job. Uh, all we are to do is to proclaim the Word of God. And to let the Holy Spirit even take the Word of God and convict men by it and through it. And hopefully, hopefully, individuals will accept it. Well, that's their choice. Uh, men have a choice to make. Uh, men have a decision that they must make regarding the gospel of Christ. All we can do is proclaim and to tell them the truth. To tell them that they are but sinners, uh, rightfully condemned to an eternity in hell. But God loves them. God sent His Son to die for them, and if they will repent of their sin, believe in Christ, they can find salvation. They will receive salvation. But that's a choice that they must make. Our job isn't to save souls, because only God can do that. Our job is to tell them how to be saved, and let God convict them. And hopefully they'll make the right choice. But that's up to them. But we are still to be doing God's work. Uh, the results are left up to God uh, and to the individuals who hear the gospel. That's the choice they have to make. But our job, our responsibilities don't change. Your responsibility as a child of God today hasn't changed. It is still your responsibility to make known the word of God. Uh, whether it seems like people are believing or not. Whether it seems like people care or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, our responsibility is still to proclaim and to make known the word of God. The word of God doesn't come back and forth. Uh, God has a purpose, and you and I today need to be yielding to that. You and I have a great responsibility today as a child of God, uh, a great responsibility to be sharing, to be making known God's Word. And uh, we today do not need to be deterred, uh, to be distracted, or to be drawn away from that work by the things of this world. A church persecuted, uh, but was still preaching, was still proclaiming God's Word. Uh, is what we find here in the book of Acts, which is exactly what we need to do today. Uh, do not, we do not need to be those who are distracted, who are pulled away from God's work because of persecution, adversities, or even silly because of circumstances. 
uh, may not be persecution. Uh, we need to be di uh, diligent uh, and devout in our efforts to proclaim and to make known the word of God. Uh, we need to trust in the Lord and not give up because circumstances may seem adverse. Uh, God's word does not return, uh, does not come back void without purpose. Uh, we are to be proclaiming the message and God is the choice. And there will be results. We may see them immediately. We, we may never see those results. But our responsibilities and our job is still the same. Proclaim the word of God. Make God's word known to anyone and everyone that we see. That is what God wants us as children, his children today to be doing. May we truly be <coughs> proclaiming the word of God. And if oh, persecution does come, may we still be found faithful in doing what God wants us to be doing. We will have a word of prayer this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you've allowed us the opportunity to be here this morning to once again hear your word proclaimed and to, uh, Father, help us as your children to understand our great responsibility, the great need we have to be making known your word that others might see you through the things that we say, through the things we do, and also hear you through the things that we say. Father, you ask that you would forgive us of our sins, of our shortcomings. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you will stand, we'll have a verse of invitation this morning. If you're here this morning, and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, all that you must do is to repent of your sin and believe and trust in Him this morning. But if you are here as a child of God, perhaps you are out of fellowship with Him, perhaps you have some burden, some need you to lay before Him, whatever that might be, if you're coming to see just a version of invitation. Well, 102. Page 102. Please. Very, very safe. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time.